Okay. All right. Ready? Here we go. That was a song. That was a hell of a song. And uh, and it shows, it actually showcases Derek's willingness to practice, practice, practice. Because he's done it for a long, long time. So if you don't know the reference to that line, practice, 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 the story goes that there was a man in New York City looking for a certain famous concert venue. And he saw a man walking down the street with a violin. And he yells out to him and says, hey, buddy, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the violinist said, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. So t today is the finale of our summer music camp. If any of you were a part of it, I hope you had fun. We learned to play some instruments. We learned a little bit more about how music is made. And that was the result. So our theme for the month at Centers for Spiritual Living is nature. And while that may make you think of uh, birds and bees and crawly things and trees, I want to talk today about human nature and about our individual natures within it. So how many times have you watched somebody sing a song or, or dance or looked at a piece of art and said, I wish I could do that. This didn't apply to anything. It, it could apply to a sweater someone has knit or a, a delicious meal they've cooked. What you're observing is the result of someone practicing over and over until the outcome conveys their nature. They probably tell you they have no idea why they have that particular inclination toward that activity. But they just, it came upon them one day and they decided to pursue it until it became a passion of theirs. Derek and I agreed when putting the class together that it should culminate in creating a song that the community could be a part of. He spent countless hours learning to compose and perform, so he was able to pick up on the vibrational tone of this community and create something that contains the energy that we generate when we're together. One of the metaphors I like to use to describe the science of mind symbol, seen here, <laughs> is inspiration, composer, song. What's happening in this process is that the idea has come, the thought, and immediately is picked up in that inspirational space. That inspiration then comes down and the composer grabs that and takes the notes one at a time and strings them together to become form to become a song. And that's the process. That's the process of creativity, of, of creating something that, that shows up as a work of art. When we, when we connect to our self, our capital S self, it's the vibration of co-creation. We are in agreement with the inspiration that we will show up and do the work in between that allows the art to come into form. We get plugged in, if you will. So you'll see I have a variety of instruments up here with me. These are just a few of my collection that I surround myself with because I'm energized by their presence. They give me reference for the creative process. And as I look at them, I feel awe at the engineering that actually makes them work. If you look at them closely, they're extraordinary. But the truth is that most of them came from fairly crude instruments. If you take the shofar in Judaism, it is used to, as a call to prayer, it is used to bring God into presence. It's a 
It's a ram's horn. And from that, you get the bugle, which is used to welcome the day, to welcome the daylight and remind us that we are <coughs> here. And then it's used to, to close out the day, to remind us that God is still nigh, even in the darkness. The trumpet, again, was re-engineered with valves. The, the bugle can only play one thing. The valves allow you to, to play any note, all the notes. So when I was growing up, the trumpet was my primary instrument. And I, I learned to play it well enough to get, it, get into college. I didn't ultimately end up following that path but it introduced me to the thread of, of my nature, of my passion. I was a reserved trumpet player. I was known to say that I played like a girl. <laughs> and in this decade, I have since relanguaged that to describe it as I like to play the pretty stuff, you know, the the lyrical stuff, the stuff that just makes you go, oh. So I tended to play from here, from here. It just, instead of here, instead of with the breath of life. The advice my teacher gave me was, if you're going to make a mistake, make it a good one. He was trying to encourage me to build resilience in the face of humiliation. He was teaching me to, to learn to fail, to learn to be okay with failure, and to know that it wasn't the end of the world. When I went to take my college audition, I was terrified that I would miss the high E flat in the first movement of the Haydn trumpet concerto. I had never hit it before, despite my trying. I practiced that piece so many times that literally I played it until the cows came home, <laughs> which my parents finally asked me to go down and play in the barn, <laughs> which ironically had beautiful acoustics. I mean, I sounded good in the barn. Of course, my accompaniment at the time sounded like a bunch of uh, attitude trombones. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but when the audition finally came, I was able to let go of the outcome. I was able to not care about what happened. And as fate would have it, and I walked into that recital hall with perfect acoustics, and I heard myself begin to play, it sounded like the barn. It sounded like that beautiful lyrical playing I could hear myself do in the barn. And I sailed right through that high E flat. I could have gone higher. I could have kept going. And I thought, who are you? But you know what that was? That was spirit flowing through me. That was me stepping into the truth of my passion, of my being. I said about it that I, I blew down the walls of my own Jericho and exceeded my limitations. I knew that it was possible. So the, the other night at music camp, we had a guest speaker, a friend of Derek's named Simone who referred to this as the flow state. She was describing her, her experience on stage. She said it was the place where everything we think, feel, hear, and see just falls away and become, we become the music itself, proving that when we let go completely and allow that part of our consciousness that knows no fear or failure take over. 
our previous expectations are surpassed with ease. So I passed that audition, and I even won a scholarship that would pay for, all for my tuition. I had to redefine the word reserved for myself in relation to my playing. For me, it came to represent the idea of listening and respecting the balance of the whole. I love to be a part of something in a way that adds to the experience of everyone, of the entire ensemble, without being at the center of it, without standing out. I like to observe and, and listen to and synthesize the information I'm gathering in order to add nuance, my own nuance, to an existing idea. An ensemble works together within a structure of notes and rhythms to create a common vibrational quality, just as wildlife does in maintaining the balance of nature. To be reserved is to have the awareness and humility to listen deeply in order to stay in balance with the rest. There's enough spotlight for everyone. And this is what we humans do when we follow a spiritual path. We don't adhere to a strict set of rules that demand it, that we show up in a certain way. Instead, we quiet ourselves through meditation and prayer and enter into that place of sacred listening. We practice the fundamentals that give us a foundation that, on which we can further build our lives. We discern the nature of the world around us. We listen for that common sound, the tone that flows through everything that is life itself. If you've ever been in a casino <laughs> and heard the, the noise of the slot machines, it sounds chaotic, but it's actually very intentional. They're playing a C major chord, which has been shown to inspire a, a, a happy, comfortable feeling so they can get people to stay there longer and lose their money. <laughs> <laughs> So whether we're consciously aware of it or not, we're always seeking that feeling. When we don't feel it, it's known in music as dissonance. Or what you hear when two notes are played right next to each other. Or when they're out of tune with each other. You hear kind of a wah, 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 wah. The note wants to just go like that. And that vibration that vibration of dissonance is actually painful to listen to. Our minds need resolution so they can rest, so they can just, uh, they want our inner and outer worlds to resonate with each other. And this is what prayer and meditation seek to create. They're instruments that help us develop a sense of peace and attunement. The dissonance that demands our attention falls away and allows us to follow that golden thread of purpose that leads us to the truth of our nature. They help us to recognize when we are out of tune, and they give us a set point to return to, a happy chord. Meditation is rest. It's the space between notes that, that run through our lives at varying speeds. A beginning musician can get really freaked out with the, about the measures of rest in between the notes. They'll usually rush through and, uh, because they're uncomfortable with the silence. They're able to count the beats as they're playing them. But once there's nothing, they get disoriented. They, when someone's heard, it has a hard time meditating, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about that discomfort of silence. Without that, some sensory direction, if the voices in our heads stop talking, we kind of lose our minds. But maybe that's exactly the point. Maybe we're supposed to lose our human minds to make room for our spiritual mind, the one 
mind. So when we learn to be still in that silence, it's the tempo of our heartbeat that becomes the constant in the quiet. There's no rush. There's no sense of beginning and end of production and rest. The one note, the happy chord, simply holds us to our center and inspires us into peace and recognize this place and return to it when our lives get uh, noisy. And then there's prayer. This word can create dissonance all by itself because of how we, how we tend to think about how it's interpreted. Sometimes, depending on who's doing it, it can sound like somebody blasting a trumpet right in your ear because they're striving to challenge rather than comfort. When I think of prayer, I remember the words of an accomplished trumpet player whose advice to me in learning to play high notes was to play long tones. Simply hold one note for as long as I could. And Brittany's meditation this morning was, was so perfect for this. She really described exactly what I'm talking about. And then as, the, as we were meditating, that ohm sound, that ohm, that long tone was continuing on and on and on. And it, it was very centering. But what that, what that tone is actually doing, it's not that the high note is not the aim of that practice. Reaching spiritual perfection is not the purpose. It was about teaching my facial muscles and the rest of my physiology to respond rather than react, to relax rather than tighten up as I was predisposed to do. It also helped increase my endurance so that I would have more air capacity. To develop the lungs that would push it out. This gave me faith that when I approached a high note, I could go right through it. I knew I could play it. So ultimately, I did not become a famous trumpet player. In fact, I rarely play these days. But what I've come to understand is doing that gave me some clues about my nature, about who I was, about what I enjoy, about what I wanted to learn more of. So when we learn to practice anything, to be disciplined about a goal, we also learn that it's not the goal that matters as much as how we approach it. Do we simply read the notes and listen to the recordings of someone else doing it? Or do we show up every day and start with long tones before attempting anything more in our day? Can we learn to rest in the silence in between? Spiritual growth is stepping out of the striving for perfection and allowing us ourselves to show up as beginners every day. It's tempting to want to master something so that we can stand above others, but without the foundational strength of practice, being at the top is a, is a very fragile place. I mean, it's true that vulnerability is a, is a good trait in a leader, but if we have not fallen and gotten back up enough times in our lives, it's a false foundation. It's brittle. So when you try new things and risk failure, you learn resilience and endurance just as the long tones did for the high notes. You build stamina to keep going. I laid down my trumpet to free myself to be vulnerable, to be a beginner at something else. I'm grateful I did that because I have learned so much more that I would have kept confined here. So a few weeks ago when I attended my 40th high school reunion <laughs> up in New Hampshire, some of the people I saw there were my bandmates, some of whom I had not seen in all 40 years. But when we saw each other, there was a super forte happy chord that went up. That connection had never left us. 
that connection of being in community with each other and creating something beautiful had led us through our lives, had informed everything we did after that. One of the composers we used to uh, play a lot in concert band, his name was Mark Malcolm Arnold, and he said, music is the social act of communication among people, a gesture of friendship, the strongest there is. This shy bunch of us who communicated so beautifully through music had since used it to connect with their own essential natures. And, and they, they move through their lives with it. I, I, it's hard to describe, but it's, I guess it is spiritual. It's the, it, it is the breath of spirit flowing through an entire group of people all at once. I've decided to name my instruments after those friends. So we've got Jeff, Carol, Lisa, Holly, Nancy, and Ed. Those were my friends. My dad used to name the uh, farm animals after the neighbors. They, <laughs> they, they appreciated that. So I hope these guys take, the, take this as a compliment and not, a, not an insult. But this lets me understand them and how they played their parts and what they sounded like and how difficult they were. My sister and I have a sort of a, <clears throat> a story between us that when we were first learning to play, she was playing the clarinet. And one day I went over. She thought something wasn't working. I went over and I just started to play it because I, I can. And she was like... So I don't play the clarinet. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't attempt to. But what I found out about that was how complicated that instrument can be. I just had three little valves and wiggling my, my face a little. They, when they accompanied me in my senior year concert, when I played the Haydn trumpet concerto for the, the, the families, um, they I had never really taken into appreciation the practice they had done to be behind me, to support me, to be my foundation. And so as I've learned to play these other instruments, I feel them. I move into that community in, in a, a more complete way. Some of you may remember uh, when Bob Sima and Shannon Plummer were here a few months ago. They're a, singer-songwriter duo, <clears throat> and they put together a deck of inspirational cards. When I was thinking about this talk, I consulted the deck with the question, what do I need to keep in mind as I do this? The card I pulled was the peacemaker, and the song it referenced was the movers, the shakers, the peacemakers, which is a line from one of my favorite poems by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. The first stanza goes, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever it seems. Here's what Bob wrote on the card. Movers and shakers are often considered the wealthy the powerful and the elite. But the new mover and shaker has a third distinction and that is as peacemaker. Our destiny is to go from a me world into a we world. And it starts with every single person holding a firm moral and ethical vision. That vision is to make the world, this world a world that is for everyone. Everyone is celebrated and brought into the circle. It might just be that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service to others, as Gandhi said. Once we land in the magical place of holding a vision for humanity, our life falls into divine alignment with a power much larger than ourselves. He concludes with a commitment we can make that says, I am a difference maker. My vision for humankind 
My vision is for humankind to thrive, not just survive. Now think about the power we have to make that happen, to alter our feelings and actions. Words and melodies and a rhythm that makes you tap your toes or blow your nose, they all come from a single thought. If I were to ask you to write a song that describes you and what you believe about yourself, what would it sound like? Would it be upbeat? Would it be a soaring ballad? Would you want the world to join you in singing it? Or would it be a lament full of sadness and regret about the things you can't forgive or forget? That's what's going on inside each of us all the time. We're composing the soundtrack of our lives with every thought. Because those thoughts are grabbed by the creative process and brought into form according to what we decide is true about ourselves. And you are the entire production company of your life. You're the generator of the idea, the composer, the performer. You might be the sound engineer, the promoter, the audience, or the consumer of the recordings. Or you might invite others in to play the parts that are not in alignment with your nature. Your song influences the environment around you, and it's up to you to decide how it is shared. Are you willing to let go when you take the risk to put your song out there knowing that people are gonna misinterpret the lyrics and sing something completely different from what you intended? Are you able to forgive others for failing to give you credit for something you feel is uniquely yours and let them share in it anyway? Are you brave enough to go back and revise something that has come through you but now sounds dissonant to your spiritual ears. We are all the music makers and the dreamers of dreams. And every one of us is a mover and shaker and peacemaker. And every change to our collective vibration begins with a single note. Go write your song and let Derek put music to it because I know you'll like what you hear, but you don't need to make so many words. <laughs> and so it is. So it is. Uh, cut you off. There you go. <clears throat>